Hey there, Vanderbilt Health. Today, I'm excited to have kind of a unique conversation here on Facebook Live, talking with one of our surgeons and a patient all about lung transplant. This is such an important topic and we've got just a phenomenal story to share with you today. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Kira Shaver, who's here with us, um, as well as Cynthia Kerr. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to have you both here. So um, why don't we first um, let each of you introduce yourselves. Dr. Shaver, would you like to go first? Sure, my name's Dr. Shaver. I came to Vanderbilt back in 2007 for my residency and fellowship and then stayed on as one of our transplant pulmonologists. So I'm delighted to be able to take care of patients like Ms. Kerr on a daily basis. Great. And what about you, Cynthia? Well, I'm Cynthia Kerr and I've lived in Nashville for 30 years. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. And after college, I settled in Nashville, started working and got into the travel business and then got this lung issue three years ago. And here I am post transplant. Well, you are setting the stage perfect. Let's dive right in. Tell me a little bit about what life was like for you prior to becoming a lung transplant recipient, what your experience was with healthcare and just had you ever even been hospitalized for any sort of breathing issue? <laughs> no. So I'm in the travel business. So, you know, I go everywhere and been to lots of third world countries and, and just really all over the place, probably 50 something countries, maybe. So I had this one experience about a breathing issue and I went to my internist and, you know, got a little shot and um, a little Z pack and I was great until the next year. I had just broken my ankle. So that was my first surgical experience. It was outpatient surgery. And, um, and then a few months later, the breathing issue came back again. And, you know, quick story was went back to see him. Then I went to my allergist and then I was um, sent to a pulmonologist. And then I left that pulmonologist and went to Vanderbilt to see Dr. Robert Miller. And, um, and then it went on from there. And yes, my transplant surgery was my first ever hospital stay. So it was a wow. nice introduction. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So Dr. Shaver, can you share about the first time you met Cynthia? Of course. So I met Cynthia last summer in clinic and my first impression of her was really her enthusiasm and her motivation for a transplant. She came with a binder with her questions and actually asked me if, if she could record me on an iPad so she, that she could review the information we went over. Uh, she was with one of her friends who had just as many questions as Ms. Kerr. Um, and it was a really fun back and forth conversation about her experiences with her lung disease and me explaining transplant. And I think the other thing that really struck me is I think Ms. Kerr was much sicker than she realized. I think she had done a great job coping with her lung disease and just had no idea uh, how unwell she was. And, and I think was a little bit surprised that we thought it was time for her to have a transplant. But it was a very pleasant clinic visit with lots of laughing um, and just excitement about, about the transplant process and what we, what we could offer her to get her back to a normal life. I love that. I love that you came so prepared for your appointments and were so engaged in your healthcare. That is so important. And I know we love seeing that in our patients. Tell us a little bit more, Cynthia, about getting that second opinion and maybe even give us a little more color of day to day life before your transplant versus maybe today. Well, um, so when I went to see Dr. Miller, my coworker said, Cynthia, I'm taking charge. You're going to see Dr. Robert Miller. I said, really? She goes, yes, you're going to see Dr. Miller. He's the best there is. And she goes, I'm going to get you in there. And so she called his office and said, you've got to get my coworker in. She needs to see you. And so I went in there and um, we had conversations, of course, and I asked a lot of questions. And yes, I do bring a notebook and I have it beside me right now. In fact, one of the pharmacists came in and said, okay, I did three hole punch because Dr. Shaver said you put everything in a three ring binder. I'm like, how does she remember that from all those months ago? So that was funny. And 
really impressive too, because there are lots of things now I don't remember. But anyway, Dr. Miller, he did approach me about a lung transplant about a year and a half into um, my meetings and appointments with him. And I, of course, was stunned. And then last March, I know he was going to bring it up to me again because I could tell I was getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't do the pulmonary function test. That was when COVID started. I'm in the travel business. We're watching our, our business just crumble and as fast as it can and canceled trips and clients that were all upset. You know, it was just a big mess last March. So we didn't talk about it in March, but June, he brought it up. And then of course I got in to see Dr. Shaver and yes, she did tell me I was much worse than I thought because I was able to cope, but I knew I was getting worse too. If things were getting um, much worse and fairly quickly too. So, and my mom could tell, I mean, everybody could tell. And of course I was the last one willing to admit I knew it, but I didn't want to say it out loud. Cause of course that means it's real. Sure. So I, um, we just got on the ball and then, you know, got into the whole evaluation week and what fun experience that was, but it was kind of well, nice. Let's pause to be for a second. Out. Before we go into the evaluation, I want to hear from Dr. Shaver about what are those characteristics? What were you looking for? What did you see in Cynthia that made her a good candidate for a lung transplant? I think there's really, I mean, there's obviously a lot of medical things that we look at, but in terms of, of the type of person that's a great candidate, there's really three things that I look for. The first is the patient needs to be really motivated to fight for their health. Um, in, in a very goal-oriented person, transplant can be complicated, but like Dr. Like Ms. Kerr said, we walk people through the process, but motivation is key. The second thing is patients really need to have a strong support system and whether that's family or friends, uh, doesn't matter as long as you have an army of people that will work with you to get you through the tough parts of transplant and be able to celebrate the good parts. And I think the last thing is patients need to be flexible um, there's lots of wonderful things about transplant, but there's some bumps in the road. And so when our patients get to a bump, they need to understand that we have a plan and they need to be flexible to work with us to, to accomplish the goals necessary to get them through those bumps. Well, here, I've just met Cynthia here on Zoom, and I can already see why you would say that she was a good candidate for that. So um, I think those are really good things to be thinking about. So you talked about the evaluation week. You just briefly touched on that, Cynthia. Tell us a little bit more about that when you were being evaluated to be a lung transplant candidate. Well, there's like 24 appointments uh, <laughs> during the week. So mine was not able to be finished in seven days and we had to change one of the um, uh, appointments to a sniff test. And I can't say the proper name. It's a esophageal manometry exam and that was not working so we had to switch it to a sniff test which kind of delayed things but you know it's a lot of lab work and a breathing test and COVID test and a heart cath and EKG I mean they are looking at everything so it was interesting it sounds frightening but it's also interesting and each visit, each doctor would say, I don't see why you wouldn't be a candidate. You know, everything looks good from my end. And so that was really reassuring. And you, you get a good work, you know, a health workup too, which was really nice and comforting. But it was busy. It kind of reminded me of our travel weeks that we would have where you're visiting one vendor to another every four minutes. And so I'm like, okay, I, I get this pace. And so it was a little bit of a rush, but yes, I was tired in between because my walking wasn't so great because my breathing wasn't so great. And, you know, you had to take deep breaths, try to sure. after about every second word. But I bet it was also exciting for you thinking about that all of this was going to lead to hopefully a really positive change in your Definitely. health, which I can, I can see clearly you, you seem just remarkable. Yes. You know, there's still a few little things I'm still recovering. And, but really for the most part, I kept telling them, I said, I don't even feel like I've had surgery. It was more of uh, just being tired afterwards. Cause I didn't really have much pain or that I remember because of that miracle epidural that they give you, which I've is, had three kids. So I know about the miracle epidural. <laughs> yes. I was like, can we keep that in for a while? And they're like, no. 
And uh, your transplant was in September, right? Yes, it was. I was called on September 17th. I don't know if you want me to go into the details on how that happened, but, and Dr. Shaver knows something that I completely forgot because I think I just went into shock. So I was on the list on the 17th and I said, okay, great. I go, I have to go because I got to meet Ashley at the Dayani for rehab. And I got to eat lunch before I go there. And my rehab appointment was at one. So at 1220, I go as fast as I can out the door to get Wits barbecue, turkey sandwich to eat quickly to be at Dayani at one. And at 1240, my phone rings. I'm like, this is, this is a car warranty service company calling me and I'm like should I do I mean this can't be this is up to 20 minutes later and um um and I go ahead and answer the phone and it was Vanderbilt saying they had lungs for me wow and I was in shock could not believe it in fact I don't even remember telling Shelly I think it was that I'd call her back yeah. and uh, and I was thinking, okay, so have we checked into everything? Do I really need, you know, you start questioning and doubting everything at that moment. Cause I was certainly not prepared for it to be that fast, but we went through. Wow. And what a great yes. story. Dr. Shaver, so I love seeing you smile. I'm sure that's so exciting every time those calls happen and, and you get to you know change someone's life with a transplant. Talk a little bit about Vanderbilt's multidisciplinary collaborative team um, and maybe a little bit about what you'd like your pulmonologist in the community to know about referring a patient when the, that right time is, a little bit of that type of information. Right. So Vanderbilt Lung Institute and the Vanderbilt Transplant Center really bring together our multidisciplinary experts in pulmonology and thoracic surgery. So when we meet patients who are referred for transplant, one of the things we want to make sure is that we've used every other treatment modality that we can. So we have lots of different pulmonary subspecialists and proceduralists who could offer things like lung volume reduction surgery and endobronchial valves and antifibrotic therapy for fibrosis, different things like that. So we try to exhaust all of those things with our multidisciplinary team and, and we're confident that we have all the specialists that we need to take care of anything that might happen to our transplant candidates or our transplant recipients. In terms of referral, I think the most important message for our community pulmonologists is that our door is open to you. So we can always be contacted by phone or through our website for an online referral or a phone call to talk about a patient. If we think a patient is a potential transplant candidate, we'll schedule them in our clinic within a few weeks and move forward as we need to. Um, I think it's better for us to see patients earlier in the disease process rather than later, because sometimes there's modifiable things with a patient that we can work on to make transplant uh, more successful for the patients. Um, our phone number is 615-936-0393, and you can either uh, leave a message or talk to one of us directly, and we'll get back to you to work through that referral process. Great. That's such good information. Cynthia, I heard that you had a family member that had a transplant a few years before you did, and so I'd just love to know what you want people to know about organ donation. Well, it was crazy. She's a cousin-in-law and she had a rare liver disease called Wilson's disease. So she was in three different hospitals and the third one was University of Tennessee Medical Center. And the doctor there goes, I think this is Wilson's disease. And one of the 10 Wilson disease specialists was at Vanderbilt. So he sent the information over and the guy at the doctor said, yes, it's Wilson's disease. She needs to get here like right now. And she comes to Vanderbilt. I go visit her in shock. Could not believe what she looked like with this advanced stage liver disease. And she goes, I want my family to stay at your condo if that's okay, because I know it'll be cleaner than a hotel. So that was like the one funny moment. But it was, it was um, really stressful because she was in dire need of a transplant. And she got transplanted with about probably 12 hours left to live. Wow. And I was like, that is the first miracle I have ever seen. And it was really incredible. My friends were all drawn into the story because it was, 
it was such a stressful time. And then you sit there and you think, wow, a donor, somebody that is willing to let the doctors take their organs out and give it to someone else. And then to be the recipient, it's such a, I still, you know, think about that, not only with her, but with me too. And it's still hard to grasp because both of us had them so fast. And um, it's truly a miracle. And you just thank God every day for these donors and what they're able to do for other people. Because, you know, at the end of the day, when she had her transplant, I'm like, I'm going to be a donor. If there's something in my body that can help somebody else, why is it going to be buried? Let's give it away. I'm not going to know. And I think that would be one of the greatest gifts. And who knew I would be a recipient? Wow. I've got long sleeves on, but I've got goosebumps from you sharing that. So, so beautiful, that, that gift that people give. Um, do you have really any closing words? Uh, this has been such a interesting um, and enlightening conversation. I'm so thankful for your time and just wonder if you have anything else you want to add. I do want to say something, but if Dr. Shaver wants to say something, of course, I want her to also. I think it's really um, one of my greatest privileges to get to take care of lung transplant recipients and to meet, you know, I meet people when they're dying from their lung disease and we walk them through this process and see them get to live their best lives afterwards. And it's truly every single day, just a delightful experience. Um, and working with Ms. Kerr over the last six or seven months has been really fabulous. And oh, I look forward sure. to the coming years. Well, and I want to say, it's such a scary process. When you're told you need a transplant, it sounds scary and you know you're going to die. So the way they walk you through this is very comforting. Like Dr. Shaver, well, we can, if this comes in, we can fix this and we can fix that. And you're like, wow, that just, that's incredible. And then you have the surgery and the team of people that are around you, the doctors that come see you all day long, starting at five o'clock in the morning uh, and, and, you know, up until midnight and the x-ray people that come in, all the nurses come in and in the ICU units. And then you get down into the step-down units and you have the, all the nurses in the step-down unit. And I mean, to tell you for what I had, there was never a pity. I never had a pity party in that hospital. I may have gotten frustrated waiting to go over to Stallworth with insurance issue, but the, like even Dr. Shaver came by and said, Cynthia, now I can tell you, you are better than you think you are. And all that reassuring from the doctors, the nurses, even the tech people and, and the people that come to clean your room or change the sheets, they could not be more supportive and take the fear out of you. And you are in the Vanderbilt bubble, which I did like, and I was there for two months and I'm a competitive person and I wanted to be out like the fastest in 10 days and that was not in my cards and it worked out fantastic, but the care and the comfort that you feel with that team takes the intimidation and the fear about 95% out of it. I mean, you have some, that's healthy fear, but um, they were absolutely incredible and I would suggest anybody that needs one, if you can get into Vanderbilt, go. All the doctors are just over the top fantastic. And the nurses, everybody was fantastic. Wow. What incredible words. Well, thank you both for your time um, and sharing with us in our community today. It was a really great conversation. Well, thank you for inviting me to be a part of it. Yeah, thank you very much.